Good afternoon and welcome to our flash panel on Belarus. Welcome here from the University of Notre Dame and its Nanovic Institute for European Studies. My name is Clement Sedmak. I'm the interim director of this institute. And the mission of the Nanovic Institute is to bring Europe to Notre Dame and to bring Notre Dame to Europe. We are doing a flash panel this afternoon. And the flash panel is a way to respond to current trends and um, issues and developments, trying to make sense of the world around us. Belarus, a landlocked country in Eastern Europe, bordered by Russia to the Northeast, Ukraine to the South, Poland to the West, and Lithuania and Latvia to the Northwest. Belarus, a nation of 9.5 million, is caught in rivalry between the West and Russia. President Lukashenko, an ally of Russia, has been nicknamed Europe's last dictator. He has been in power for 26 years, keeping much of the economy in state hands and using censorship and police crackdowns against opponents. Now there is a huge opposition movement demanding new democratic leadership and economic reform. They say Mr. Lukashenko rigged the 9th August election. Officially, he won by a landslide. His reporters say his toughness has kept the country stable. We have read headlines in the past few weeks about Belarus. Headlines in different newspapers such as, Belarus has woken up. Belarus protesters defy government crackdown to march through Minsk. Belarus authorities strip accreditation from foreign journalists. Belarus, the battle for democracy. Belarus, tens of thousands of protesters flood Minsk for second week. Belarus defined protesters flood Minsk demanding Lukashenko's removal. We also read a headline in Catholic News Agency 
border guards stop Catholic Archbishop from returning to Belarus. That was on August 31st. So what is going on? Why is it happening? And which are scenarios for the future? We will try to explore some of these questions through a wonderful panel. We have four panelists with us. I will introduce them in the order of their speaking slots to you. We have Violeta Varishuskaya, a Master of Global Affairs candidate here from the University of Notre Dame, originally from Belarus. She will speak on the background on the situation and possible causes that have led to the current situation in Belarus. Welcome, Violeta. Thank you for joining us. We have Rodion Beliak, who holds an MBA from Notre Dame from 2019 and who has been a participant in the protests in Belarus. Rodion will show a video that he has accessed and will give us an overview of the development of the situation in Belarus and some insights from the experience on the ground. Welcome, Rodion, and thank you for joining us. We have Dimitro Sharangovsky, a senior lecturer at the political science department from Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Dimitro, thank you so much for joining us. It's quite late. It's your place in the universe. It's 9 p.m., so we appreciate your participation. Dimitro will share thoughts from the perspective of Ukraine and addressing the situation with Russia. Welcome. And then we have Catherine Younger talking to us from wonderful Vienna, Austria. She's the research director from Ukraine and European Dialogue at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. And Catherine will share thoughts, particularly about European perspective and the first-hand accounts that her institute has been compiling. Thank you, Catherine, for joining us and welcome. The idea is that we have uh, five to seven minutes for each panelist, and then we open it up for questions. And uh, please make use of the Q&A function. I will try to feed the questions to our panelists. And we will start, as I said, with Violetta, who will give us some background on the situation. Violetta, the floor is all yours. Thank you again and welcome. Thank you, Professor Sadmak. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, perfect. Can you see that? Just to make sure. Professor Clemens? Yes, we can see it. Looks okay, good. perfect, perfect. So in my part of the presentation, I would like to talk about the president of Belarus. Professor Zemek has already covered some information about him. He has been a president of Belarus for more than 26 years, and he has been running the country since 1994. It's important to understand that both in Belarus and in many parts of its countries, he has been seen as a guarantor of stability in Belarus. And in my part of the today's presentation, I would like to give some factors that most probably impact to making him to destroy this image of a guarantor of stability of Belarus. So one of the first things that I would like to talk about is the economic situation in the country. And I would like to talk about the economic situation in the country from a perspective of just ordinary citizens of Belarus. So the economy of Belarus has been in stagnation for quite a few years, but ordinary citizens could see that because they never achieved this famous $500 threshold as an average salary for Belarus. I want to highlight this $500 threshold because it's been a, a slogan of uh, President Lukashenko. So one of his slogans, I think since I was a child, was everyone gets $500 as a salary. And as you can see from this graph, We've never managed to reach this $500 threshold in my country. While we are talking about the economy of Belarus, it's also, it's also important to notice that Belarus is highly dependent on the situation in Russia and on the economy in Russia. There were negotiations between my president, uh, President Lukashenko, and Russian President Putin, uh, and about the bringing the integration between Belarus and Russia on a new level. As you might already know, the integration between Russia and Belarus has been pretty, pretty strong. And many people, uh, many people met this discussion about their new step of an integration with a lot of resistance. There were protests in Belarus in the end of 2019 and in the beginning of 2020. And I think it was one of the reasons reasons how Lukashenko managed to destroy his image of a guarantor of stability because how can you bring a stability to the country where is the there is a threat to its, its independence 
Another important factor is that, that is all over the news is the situation with the coronavirus in Belarus. And I think we've all heard about the irresponsible response of our government to the situation. I think we became notorious all over the world because we didn't have the lockdown because our president said to treat coronavirus with vodka and sauna. And I think, yeah, there is like, uh, there is some truth about the, of the whole situation, but taking into consideration the mentality of the Belarusian people and the response of the government, I would say it was one of the last drops to destroy the image of the of the guarantor civility rather than like as an important separate reason for for the protests on the streets right now. Again, this is my personal opinion. It might be wrong, but I think like the situation with COVID was was important, but it's not. It wasn't one of the vital reasons why uh, why Belarusians are on the streets right now. Uh, one of the most vital factors is obviously the usage of internet in my country. So as you can see from this graph, internet is used by a huge amount of population in the country. So almost every single person who is aged up to 54 uses the internet daily. And it's important because right now we do have access to a lot of independent media websites. And it's important for Belarus because it created a sense of integrity within the community. Before, many, many population groups were dissatisfied with the situation of the country and with the policies of uh, President Lukashenko, but they mostly shared their dissatisfaction within their family member groups or like with their friends. But with the help of the internet, uh, in, uh, sorry, with independent media uh, sources, people could comment on their articles about the government actions and everything. And people could understand that there are actually many more people who think the same way as they do, uh, rather than just their friends and family members. Uh, while I'm talking about the internet, I also wanted to show like a new trend on this independent media websites. Uh, so this year they conducted uh, they conducted election polls. Obviously, we cannot treat this election polls as official polls, but the problem with the official polls in Belarus is that they are run by the government agencies and they cannot be treated seriously because Lukashenko obviously wins the elections like with the, the hugest possible country population. Uh, as you can see on this graph, and this poll was conducted on one of the most famous Belarusian independent media sources. Uh, so that Lukashenko was not as was not popular at all. He just got 6% of the population, while other uh, opposition candidates, especially these three candidates, they got like approximately 80% of the whole population, uh, of the whole percentage of voters who voted on that website. It's important because again, like it created, um, it created an integrity within the community because people could see again that they're not the only ones who are against Lukashenko and who are against the policies, but there are actually many more people who agree with them and who are waiting for changes in the country. And while I'm here on this side, I on this slide, I also wanted to talk about I think one of the gravest mistakes uh, of Lukashenko. So he definitely underestimated the role of women in our country. As you can see here, uh, Tikhanovskaya was not really popular in the beginning of the presidential uh, of the presidential poll. But what Lukashenko did with these two candidates, so one of them he was detained like two months before the election date, and the second one was forced to flee the country. Lukashenko said that woman is not able to run the country and nobody is going to vote for the woman. And we know what happened in Belarus and most probably Tikhanovska gained the majority of votes in the country. Women also played an important role in the society because even though during the first days of the protest, there were mostly men who went on the street, but they were forced with such a huge amount of violence that their mothers, sisters, their friends, their female friends could not just look at that and could not be silent. And that's how women went on the streets. And they played a vital role uh, in this protest and in the situation uh, in Belarus that we have right now. I think that John will talk more about that. And with that, I will finish my part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Violeta. And thank you so much for respecting the time. And you said, a lot in, in those uh, short seven minutes, much appreciated. Before we move on to Rodion Beliak, uh, we will show a video and I hope the technology will not leave us. Connor, who is our front man about the technology, will show a video and I just want to alert you that the content is somewhat disturbing. 
Connor, thank you. Thank you very much, Connor, and thank you, Rodion, for giving those videos to us. And now the floor is yours to explain some of the backgrounds. Please, Rodion, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, basically, I don't know uh, if you were able to see the videos uh, properly. I had some uh, technical lags, I believe. But essentially, what you uh, saw in the videos was uh, special police forces uh, beating up uh, completely peaceful people marching through the streets of Minsk. And this situation uh, happens every day in our cities at the moment. So we have uh, secret police services with their faces covered with masks who use unmarked vehicles and uh, they uh, attack and kidnap uh, peaceful protests and activists all around the country. And what is uh, the most disturbing uh, from it at the moment is that uh, many of uh, these uh, protesters, uh, after kidnapping, uh, we can find them in prisons, uh, but in some cases, um, they're not uh, very uh, frequent at the moment, but uh, they still happen, we can't find them at all. And uh, some of these people whom we cannot uh, find, uh, we then uh, find uh, dead in forests and rivers and uh, quiet streets of our capital. And this is uh, very terrifying to everybody who is uh, in the country. But anyway, I think uh, you are not, uh, you may be not uh, be so interested in uh, watching the videos because you can watch them in the news. Uh, I suggest you my own story uh, because I participated in the protests and was detained. And I can tell you about my own personal experience. So basically, um, I didn't want to go to Belarus. I just had a vacation and uh, I needed to make uh, some documents uh, for my uh, newly born child. So I had to go back to my country where I uh, hadn't lived for uh, several years before that. Uh, we all were very naive in Belarus at that moment. We hoped, uh, we had that idea that if 70% uh, of people or 80% of people would vote for an opposition leader, uh, Lukashenko would step down. They, uh, he would have no choice and he would step down automatically. But uh, that didn't happen. Um, as election day, I voted, uh, voted as a normal citizen. I went home uh, and everything was fine. Uh, everything was fine until in the, broad, uh, in the middle of the day, the internet collapsed. So there was no uh, internet completely in the country. I had a uh, special software installed on my uh, phone, uh, a VPN, uh, so I was able to read the news. And what I started to read was terrible. I saw footage of people being killed in Minsk, uh, like uh, peaceful protesters without any arms or stones or uh, cocktails of Molotov. Uh, they were just uh, shot on the streets of Minsk by special police uh, forces. And at that moment, I understood that uh, even though I didn't want to participate in the protests, uh, I had to. So I went uh, on the central street of my uh, hometown, which is the second largest city in Belarus, and started uh, to clap hands. Uh, that's literally what I did. Uh, that was 10th of August. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I was surrounded by the same people as me. Uh, we were just uh, staying on the street, uh, streets, happy, uh, clapping hands, mm, not even shouting anything uh, seriously. Uh, but and everything went pretty peacefully. But then uh, special forces occurred. They had uh, metal shields and buttons, and they started to uh, beat uh, with buttons in the shields, producing uh, very strong noise. We all understood that uh, the things were not going in a good direction and uh, decided to leave uh, the streets. But it was unfortunately too late. 
because when we started uh, to leave uh, the central street, uh, we were uh, arrested in the small streets around it. Uh, personally, I uh, didn't even notice how uh, I was arrested. It all happened just in a second. I just saw the people uh, starting to run in front of me. And next uh, moment, I was on the ground with my uh, hands uh, behind my back and uh, the policeman uh, hand around my neck. That's how I was arrested. And after that, uh, three days of hell uh, for me began. Uh, first, I was taken to the police station uh, where uh, I and all the detainees were severely beaten. I got uh, extremely lucky uh, in that situation because uh, the four guys, four police officers who were beating me were pretty short. I think they were uh, last year students of the police academy and they just didn't have enough force to uh, make a serious harm to me. But other protests uh, who were uh, with me were beaten by trained operatives of special forces and they uh, were literally uh, killed by the blows. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the second day we had uh, a trial, if we can uh, name this process a trial. Uh, so basically next to me was a medical student from Turkmenistan, that's a country in the uh, Central Asia. Uh, he was just unlucky um, by uh, out of curiosity going out of his dormitory uh, when, he, uh, uh, when he heard uh, loud noises on the streets. He was arrested uh, with us, beaten, and uh, sentenced to the same prison term as we did. So you can imagine that uh, no evidences were taken into account during this, those trials. Uh, after the trial, uh, we were uh, returned back into the police station where we had to witness another uh, party, another uh, shipment of uh, prisoners being uh, beaten in front of our eyes. Uh, I would say that I would never forget uh, this uh, picture in my life. And uh, the guy who was sitting next to me uh, just went crazy from what he saw. Um, after that, we were all delivered to prison. In the prison, we spent uh, two days in a cell that was initially made for just one human being but we were 25. We had no food, uh, we had water, uh, we had toilet in the cell, uh, we had no soap, uh, we had no toilet paper. We had to sleep on the floor, uh, like concrete floor, which was cold because it was uh, ground floor, uh, and wait uh, until our destiny would be decided. Honestly, uh, everybody uh, of us uh, thought uh, that uh, we are all dead because from the treatment uh, that we had uh, at the police station, we realized that any of us could be killed and never uh, been found again. And uh, at the third day, uh, unexpectedly, we all were released. At least majority of us uh, got released. We, uh, in the beginning, we didn't understand why we were released. Uh, it was not explained. We had no connection to the outer world. We had no uh, phones. We couldn't even tell our relatives that we were arrested in the first place and detained in the second. Uh, but uh, when we got released, we uh, found out that uh, it was sent uh, to our uh, mothers and uh, in general, uh, women in Belarus uh, girls and women, they took flowers and went out to the streets uh, demanding the authorities to stop this terrible violence. And uh, authorities didn't have the nerve to beat and kill them too. Thank so you, they had... Okay, okay. No, no, you can wrap up in, in a minute. But... Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a short uh, story of mine. Uh, I'm at the moment in Moscow. I had to flee from my country and Moscow is not uh, really safe for me because uh, it's exactly like Belarus. We, uh, they just don't have the protests. Uh, I am on the way to a safe place, um, but uh, at the moment still not yet there. Thank you, Rodion. And best of luck, of course. We will come back to, to your story. 
We move on to Dimitro uh, from Lviv, Ukrainian Catholic University in Ukraine. Um, maybe you could please share your perspective from Ukraine and addressing the situation with Russia. Thank you, Dimitro. Thank you, Clemens, for having such opportunity to talk here. And thank you, Radion, for sharing this personal story. And did I have the same, um, the same stories because a number of my friends in Belarus, they actually had very typical situations. We were chatting with them, so uh, they were talking and presenting all their experience. But while I showed this video, actually, I uh, and looking at your story, uh, I really recall in memory of the Maidan times that uh, that we have in 2014 in Ukraine. So, and typically, even the same sometimes pictures uh, were pretty the same. Uh, so many people from Belarus are still concerned about making. Uh, some associations of uh, their protests with Maidan, and uh, definitely there is uh, there is a reason for that. And uh, to some extent, that good of making this differentiation, because uh, frankly speaking, many Ukrainians are very biased about understanding and presenting situation in Belarus through their and our Maidan experience. And many experts in Ukraine, including myself, spend hours trying to persuade Ukrainians not to look on Belarus with Ukrainian glasses. That is still important to understand the situation. Nevertheless, uh, let me introduce a few points regarding the Ukrainian perspective on the uh, Belarus protests, and uh, especially in terms of, uh, of Russia, because while well, for Ukraine, uh, for Belarus, sorry, this is an issue of uh, power usurpation, human rights uh, violation. But for Ukraine, this is definitely in terms of uh, this is a political issue or even geopolitical issue and definitely security issue. So a Russian factor is still very present uh, for Ukraine, at least in this, uh, in the Belarusian uh, in topic. Uh, while for them, it's not plain, so it's not ideological or it's not geopolitical. And we can see that there were not, for example, European flags as were well during Ukrainian Maidan and Euro, uh, revolution. So it's not the geopolitical choice, but for Ukraine, uh, it is geopolitical. So we are really um, definitely uh, paying attention to the uh, security issues because uh, uh, destabilizing situation uh, in Belarus, where we have the most broad, we have very uh, long border, is, is definitely dangerous for Ukraine, who is still in the situation of, uh, um, of fight and uh, of war with, uh, with Russia. So security is very important. And it's more important because Belarus and Russia are union states. And uh, according to their agreement, they share not only um, like economical or, for example, cultural, as it's written in the agreement, but also some military aspects. And we definitely know that in 2015 and 2016, uh, Russian used Belarus territory for their flights. So the Russian flights were flying around the Ukrainian border and uh, they were unofficially um, imitating the attacks on the Ukrainian objects of the borderline. So we are deeply concerned in Ukraine about any strengthen of the uh, of Russia uh, uh, in terms of uh, of these protests and uh, uh, and elections. So uh, Ukrainians are really afraid of the uh, possibility of pro-Russian candidates that that could come in terms of the democratic uh, um, outcomes. But that is that, that that's true. It could be so. That there is even some political myth in Ukraine that was shared among pro-Russian uh, pro-Russian powers, political powers that Lukashenko is the only only one who can secure a situation in Belarus. So the same myth, political myth that was translated in, in Belarus and is translated in Russia. So it, for Ukraine, at least for Ukrainian media, uh, it is presented rather than pro-Russian or anti-Russian orientation, but while, while it's not in, uh, in Belarus. Uh, there is also important to, to mention that uh, in terms of economies, so for Belarus, Ukraine is really important because it's one of the largest markets. If I'm not mistaken, the third, we are, Ukraine is the third largest trade partner. Uh, th therefore, we are also interested to have, uh, to have these ties and to have this business. Uh, however, uh, actually, uh, in, the, in the last few days, uh, the, uh, so Ukraine during the start of, uh, of the protests, 
we, we were we, we definitely uh, convict violations of human rights, uh, but we, we were a little bit quieter. So our official position, and president was a little bit quiet about the recognition of Mr. Lukashenko as president elected. And it was due to the issue with the so-called Wagner group. So the, the terrorist group or the military group uh, of Russians uh, an official that, that was uh, captured in Belarus. And there was a talks between uh, Mr. Zelensky, Ukrainian president and uh, uh, Mr. Lukashenko before elections like uh, to, uh, to bring this group to Ukraine because this group is considered to be fighting uh, this Ukrainian regular army in Donbass. So we were really interested in that. There is why officially Ukrainians were not uh, so the Ukrainian president was not criticizing at first days, uh, we should admit that. Nevertheless, Ministry of Foreign Affairs conducted uh, th this letter joint, it was a joint letter together with uh, this Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland and Lithuania in so-called um, uh, Lublin Triangle, the new format of uh, collaboration. So we accused uh, and uh, uh, these uh, these violations, and we supported the uh, the people of Belarus. Uh, but after after Mr. Lukashenko brought this uh, Wagner group back to to, to Russia, so uh, we started to be more active, and especially after the uh, European. Um, signals and the European letters of support for uh, people of, uh, of Belarus in the terms. So what we have right now, we have uh, definitely uh, accusing um, Mr. Lukashenko and blaming him for, uh, for making tremendous violation of human rights. Uh, we also, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mitro Koleba, um, just stated a few days ago that Ukraine will not interfere into the Belarus uh, uh, affairs. However, we wish good luck for, uh, for citizens of Belarus, but we support people. And we, uh, we even opened our borders that we closed recently for uh, Belarus refugees, uh, for Belarus political refugees, if, if they have such need. Uh, and uh, for Ukrainian, main Ukrainian interests, so we, we are deeply interested in strong Belarus and democratic Belarus. Dimitri, can I please ask and you to wrap up? I'm looking at the watch a little bit. Uh, once more? Could I please ask you to wrap up? I'm the timekeeper here. Oh, pardon, pardon. Okay, sorry for that. So I'll just, I'm just finish it. So we're interested in, in very strong Belarus, democratic Belarus. So we don't want to interfere into that agenda. However, we are deeply concerned about any signs of uh, increasing of Russian presentees in the, in the region and increasing of Russian influence in the region. So that's shortly what we have from Ukrainian position. Thanks a lot, Dimitri. Thank you so much. That was really helpful for us to understand. We will move on to another European perspective or a perspective from Europe. Catherine Younger from the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Catherine, thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clemens. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you to the Nanovic Institute for organizing an event about a topic that really truly does deserve as much attention as we can stand to give it. Thank you to Violetta and to Dmitro for your insights. And thank you, Rodion, for sharing your story as well. I think these firsthand stories are what is so key to drawing more attention to the topic, to helping people actually understand what's going on. So I really appreciate that. Um, what I want to do very briefly is just to add a bit of perspective on how things look from the outside and specifically from the perspective of somebody sitting here within the EU. Um, what I'm going to say is going to echo and build on what everyone else has already said because you've all raised some really important points already. So what I would say is in the weeks since August 9th, I can see two contrasting tendencies that have emerged. On the one hand, I would say, and this is, I'm going to start with the positive aspect, which is that I do think that the quality of discussion over what's happening in Belarus has improved as time has gone on. If on August 9th, August 10th, the headlines were still saying, according to official re results, Lukashenko wins in a landslide. That is no longer the case, right? That now there is increasing nuance, there's increasing care given to actually making sense of what's happening with these protests. 
This is not to say that the information that's coming out is perfect. There are plenty of flaws still there, but emphasis is being shifted to the protest peaceful nature. Attention is being paid to the many Belarusians who are being detained, tortured, and disappeared, right? So there is this shift happening. And so that is what's going on in the public discourse. And I think it's that is some sign for optimism, right? Not, not thoroughgoing, but there is at least some. On the other hand, and this is where I get more pessimistic, in terms of the actual concrete response, there's not been very much happening here, right? Um, the most sort of recent event on August 28th, a summit of EU foreign ministers to consider sanctions, what they ended up doing is saying maybe a sanctions against a handful, 15, 20 people, right? And this is the extent of the actual concrete response that's happening. It's, you can see something like the poisoning of Alexei Navalny getting so much more attention in the public sphere than these protests which have been going on for weeks. And I think we can talk about reasons for why this is happening. And um, what I would say is that here, and I'm going to actually echo some of what Mitro was saying, the geopolitical is trumping everything here. Um, even more than Ukraine in 2014, Belarus is really a black hole in the understandings and in the mental maps of Europe that European diplomats, that politicians have. So they simply aren't equipped with the information, the knowledge, the ability to think about how their actions can affect things, right? So what happens then? In the wake of the, in the, in the kind of wake of a lack of information, immediately the mind goes to Russia, right? So then immediately everything becomes this discussion of how will what we do, how will these protests, how will this affect Russia's response? And this is even seen in, so Angela Merkel addressed the situation in Belarus in her annual press conference recently, but what she did in fact is focused on Belarusians' right to democracy free of foreign influence rather than democracy free from fraud and state violence, right? So again, it's about Russia, the, the threat of Russia interfering, things like that, rather than saying there is a fundamental right to have your votes counted, to be able to protest without violence being inflicted on you, all of these sorts of things, right? So immediately the focus goes back to preventing or trying to game out what Russia is going to do. Now I would say, as Mitro already pointed out with his reference to the Lublin Triangle, there are some exceptions to that that are rooted in historical causes. And as a historian, I very much want to draw attention to the history here. So the Lublin Triangle has refers back to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was an entity that existed from 1569 to 1795, a, in, within which Lithuania the, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania actually controlled the territory of modern Belarus, right? So there is this historical connection there. And thus it makes a lot of sense that Lithuania in particular has been dedicating attention, money. It has offered refuge to Tsikhanouskaya when she needs to leave the country for her own safety, et cetera. Now there's a separate kind of tendency going on in Poland, the other major neighbor that's a major factor here, Whereas Poland was hugely supportive um, it, during the Orange Revolution and Maidan in Ukraine, the situation now is much more complicated with regards to Poland. And that has to do with Poland's internal political dynamics, right? It is hard given the current government in Poland, for which is anti-democratic in its own way, to full-throatedly, wholeheartedly support democratic protests in Belarus without drawing attention to its own internal contradictions. Okay, so that aside, what I would say is starting from a baseline of minimal knowledge, as we're saying, it's perhaps unsurprising that discussion of Belarus is dominated by cliches and hand-wringing from diplomats and politicians. Um, so where can, we, where can we go from here? What can we do? And I think events like this that we're doing here today, these discussions that we're having are crucial to that. The other thing I want to talk about very briefly, because I know my time is running out. Two is minutes. One Okay, <laughs> is one small project that we at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna are doing that I would love to share with you so that you can take a look at later if you want to. Um, and this is a small um, blog that we have begun to put together of materials coming out of Belarus. So this is a collection of things that include um, people. So our institute has hosted many Belarusians in the past. So some of them have given interviews. They've talked with us. We have poetry in here, things like that. And the motivation behind this, and this is what I think is crucial and is going to be 
the key as we go forward and we try to kind of maintain Belarus at the forefront of our minds is bringing voices from Belarus up from a variety of perspectives to the forefront, making them accessible to a Western audience. So we've in, engaged several translators who are then providing these materials in English and in German so that they're not simply in Russian and Belarusian. And I would really, if you, if you have any interest, I would highly recommend that you take a look at this. There are some really fascinating things that people have come up with and that have provided to us. And it's an ongoing project that we will continue to update in, follow, in the following weeks. So thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm sure we can find this blog on the website of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Exactly, iwm.at. Yes, iwm.at. Okay, thank you so much, dear panelists. I've heard many things, uh, mainly four. Number one, violence, security, stability, human rights is a major concern. Number two, the question of data and official data. We heard about minimal knowledge, the black hole, and that's where this importance of first store hand, I mean, first person stories and accounts come in, the authority that Rodion provided, as well as the blog from Vienna. Thirdly, the role of women and girls uh, as, as an important political force to reckon with. And fourthly, international relations and comparisons, the Lublin Triangle, Russia and Ukraine. I have in the Q&A three questions. I will make these two. The first question I would ask Rodion and Violetta to answer. The question is, I saw that one of the videos of violence against protesters was from TikTok. Would you say TikTok is a popular media for change among young people in Belarus? Is TikTok less regulated by the government compared to more traditional media sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Maybe Rodion first and then Violetta. The TikTok question. I think uh, TikTok is just a way of uh, disturb, uh, distributing the information. Uh, we, uh, we don't have a regulation of internet mass media in Belarus. The only thing that uh, our government can do because it's all international platforms, it's basically to block uh, a website, but uh, they are unable to do this for large platforms like YouTube, Facebook, or uh, uh, TikTok. So TikTok is just uh, an, an accident. Thank you, Rodion. Violetta, anything to add? Yeah, I actually wanted to include that in my presentation, but because I had to choose what to include, I did not include this part. So I wanted to talk about the role of Telegram as an important platform, social platform for this protest. And because I saw this question earlier, I actually found the statistics and I would like to share that with you. Just give me a sec. I'll share my screen again. But it's really interesting. So is, as you can see here, it's one of the most popular channels that was like um, was in charge of the protest in Belarus. And as you can see right now, they have 2 million subscribers. Obviously, not all of them are people from Belarus. Obviously, like some of them are from Poland, from Ukraine, from Russia. But still, like Belarus is the country of like 9.5 million population. And like it's a huge number for our country. And you can see the number of subscribers here. And like you see that we had an election day on August 9th and the number of subscribers was like 500,000. But like after the protest started, the number of subscribers reached this number. And like, it's really impressive. And why is it Telegram? I think it's because Telegram was positioning itself as a like safe uh, way to communicate information and everything. And I know that Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram, was trying to support Belarus during the elections and everything, you know, like after the election day. So I would say Telegram was one of the most important platforms for Belarus. I'm not that sure about TikTok. Like, I'm not in Belarus right now. And to be honest, I don't even have Instagram and I don't have TikTok, but Telegram was definitely one of the most important ones for Belarus. Great, thank you, Violeta. Thanks a lot. I would like to combine questions two and three from Yuri Pidlinsny, a colleague from Dimitro from the Ukrainian Catholic University. And I would ask Dimitro and Catherine maybe to respond to that. Who could potentially lead protests in Belarus who could become a real person with whom US or EU or other geopolitical can negotiate? And what is the real goal of protests? Electoral truth, democratization, national revival. So this is the protest question, which goes to uh, Dimitro first and then Catherine. 
Okay, thank you and greetings, uh, Yuri from Lviv. Yes, you have to impress your colleague now. That's a stressful yeah, thing. That's, that, that's true. So um, I think that uh, in, in general, uh, so there, there, there is actually a big deal in terms of protesters and in terms of opposition, because we know from the uh, social and political science uh, that uh, not too often such differentiated protestings can make a big difference. So it's really cool and it's very effective as we see in Belarus uh, that we have different points of, uh, of protesting and it's really difficult sometimes for militia, for police like to, to be at the same place in different parts of the country because they are uh, they're really happening, uh, so small groups are really happening at the, uh, at the different times. However, for the very effective changes, you do uh, need a concentration of power, so to talk with somebody. And uh, definitely this power is um, differentiate what we see right now, because the number of the representatives of Belarusian opposition is not longer in Belarus. It, it, they were not longer in Belarus even before 2020 uh, because of the political oppression. Uh, the number of them, uh, they will simply be captured uh, if, if they uh, have a step on the territory of Belarus and uh, we definitely know them. So there is a big question because the current uh, representation and uh, especially with the uh, Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya, uh, so she, she told that uh, her main action and her main role is just to uh, to start democratization process, actually. So it was even before the election that it was officially declared uh, by the opposition that that was united, that the main task is actually to, to do the real elections and to make different people uh, possible to, to be elected. So this is a main issue. So uh, I would rather say that uh, for the opposition, uh, there is a big challenge for them. And uh, we don't know who will be the real leader. Uh, but now it's Tikhanovska, but guys, she will be. She was the teacher of English like two months ago, and suddenly she she, she became like the, uh, the center of the demonstration, like very powerful figure, but only figure. She's not a professional politician. So this step uh, should be done, and uh, I'm definitely sure we can talk with Belarusian colleagues. But as a political scientist, I would definitely say that uh, this is not uh, about the uh, national revival. It's it's rather the the democratization process and uh, fight for the eternal right to, to elect and to be elected. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitro. When you say prof professional politician, I wonder whether this is a compliment or an insult. Catherine, do you have a comment on the protest question? Um, I think what Dimitro has said here is extremely important, which is that this is not there is not a figure who the opposition can unite behind. And in fact, that is not necessarily, I understand that in the long run, that can be a downside, but in the short run, I actually think that's a real strength of these protests, right? And Mitro said that himself, but I just want to emphasize that, that without a single sort of con potentially, a, a figure head is always controversial, right? So there's always going to be people who like them and who don't like them. Whereas when it is decentralized in this way, it is possible to bring all of your hopes and expectations out onto the streets. And at least for the time being, that strikes me as the most important thing that can be going on, right? Is to keep out there, to keep in the streets. But in fact, I would love to hear more from Violeta and Rodion because you guys know much better than we do with regards to, I mean, basically, right, if we kind of go backwards in time, the three opposition candidates who united together are themselves all sort of stand-ins for opposition figures who were arrested or not allowed to participate in the protests. And so I would be curious to know from you guys if any of them are legitimate or like re reasonable figures going forward if new elections were able to be held. I'd be curious to know what you think. Great. Violetta, do you want to go first and then Rodium? Okay, if I can share my personal opinion, I would support Tsukala, that's for sure, because he has had some background in like in this kind of positions, he has been a diplomat. He worked for the U.S. embassy, oh, for a Belarusian embassy in the U.S. I think, and he worked for the United Nations. So even though I know that Babarika had more support than Sapkala, I think like he is more suitable for this kind of positions. But yeah, again, it's my personal opinion. I wouldn't vote for Tikhanovsky, the husband of Tikhanovska, that's for sure. But yeah, Sapkala, I think like, he would be suitable for this kind of positions. Thank you, Violeta. Rodia? Sorry, just if I could just jump in there. 
he it, that brings in this question of the IT sector as well, right? Because is he's been he was the one who headed the high tech hub and all of that. So that's also right. seemed crucial. Yeah, and it's extremely important for Belarus because IT sector is growing right now and a lot of people from the IT sector are going to leave the country because they don't know what to do. And with the internet shutdown, like it was really terrible for them. And many of my friends are working in IT right now and they're like, oh, we don't even know what to do. Should we stay in the country or should we go? Because like nobody knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Rodion, your view on the protest movement and the figures who could emerge. Yes, uh, so I completely agree with the point of view that uh, the, strength, uh, the strength of the protests is uh, basically in the absence of the leaders. Uh, uh, it's not actually like completely true. Um, we just united together and everybody is a leader at the moment. Every citizen who does anything brave and exceptional is uh, tremendously supported by everybody else around him. Uh, we have huge uh, funds collected uh, over uh, just two days to support, uh, for example, striking workers or people who were uh, hurt during the protests and uh, during the detentions in prisons. But um, the problem with leaders in Belarus is that uh, the, the moment you uh, become a, a recognizable leader of a protest, you would uh, follow the destiny of Alexei Navalny in Russia. So you will be either arrested, that's a good scenario for you, or forced to leave, that's the best one, I would say. Uh, the worst scenario, and we saw that in uh, 1999, uh, where um, I believe about five people who could be potential leaders of the protests were kidnapped in the broad day in the center of Minsk and nobody ever saw them again. So we had to create this strategy of having no leaders in Belarus in order just to protect people. And that's where high profile may help. People with a high international profile are, you know, less likely to disappear. No, no, it's not the case for Belarus. They don't care. Yeah. You know, this, this makes me really sad, this, this panel so far. Uh, when, one question is, will the protests be successful? And maybe in the very last round, you can talk about that. We have two questions, which I call foreign relations questions. One question is about the European Union. What specific actions might the European Union or individual European states take to support the democracy movement? I would ask maybe Catherine and Dimitro to react to that. And then we have the US question. Given the oft ham fisted US diplomacy regarding Eastern Europe, and especially tolerant of Russia, what would Belarus citizens want to expect from the US? And maybe we could ask Rodion and Violetta to talk about the US perspective. So expectations vis-a-vis -vis the EU or European countries. Catherine, you go first and then Dimitro. Sure. So here, basically, what's the possibilities open to the EU, in my mind, kind of go in two directions, right? One of which is negative consequences, which has to do with sanctions and things like that. They can imp impose those. Who knows? There's ongoing debates about the effectiveness of sanctions, etc. But at least it can be a symbolic gesture. The other, on the other hand, there are positive steps that the EU can take, such as pouring money into the protest, right, offering money to the protest movements, offering money to ongoing initiatives going forward to build democracy, things like that, these sorts of initiatives. And um, think, you know, the sort of dreaming big, why not start talking about offering visa-free travel to the EU? Right? Like, I know this is like a far-fetched dream, but it happened for Ukrainians and the EU has not fallen apart in the meantime, right? So there are things that you can start talking about that kind of connect Belarusians much more to the rest of the continent, right? And that then goes a long way towards that. Thank you, Catherine. Dimitro. Okay, I, I simply joined the idea. So Catherine, however, a little bit skeptical. So uh, in that things, because we, we know that even 
Greece, while well, they were talking in the Commission, so Greece started the process of, uh, um, of, of, of making some uh, opposition to this because of the personal ideas in the, uh, of the budget, of the European budget, so it was simply stopped and there is, there, there is no the declaration from the side of European Commission, while from the European Parliament it was, because many of the very political. So the first uh, realistic step will be just uh, to be a little bit more than deeply concerned. Uh, just keeping this, uh, this item, uh, keeping this situation more closely and referring to this. So at least to translate on different, um, on, on different places, on, on different uh, negotiations and talks. This is really important not to forget about this. Because look, it's really hard, especially for the, for the country that is really considered as a black hole, even for Europe, to be present on the news just even for us. So do we remember what is happening in Taiwan right now? So uh, yeah, so it's, it's really hard for them. So it's important for bureaucracy like to lighten the, uh, the events that, that, that is happening. And definitely uh, Europeans should talk more with, uh, with Lukashenko because um, first, just show this position that, she, that he will be cut and he is cut it from the European affairs. But nevertheless, it's important to talk with him. Yes, and uh, so- Thank you, Dimitru. Forums. Yep. Sorry, I have to cut you short. Thank you, Dimitru. Yeah. We have five minutes left and we need to end on time. So we have this question, what would Belarus citizens expect from the United States? Rodion and Violetta are both studying or have studied in the United States. So that's a good question for you. Rodion, you go first and then Violetta. Uh, I, I personally don't think that uh, United States can do a lot. I think uh, European Union can do much more. And for European Union, I would say that European politics uh, should uh, start to understand whom they are dealing with uh, in uh, countries like Belarus and Russia. They, uh, in my opinion, uh, I studied their policy for a pretty long time. They think uh, that they can make negotiations with these people and uh, make peace and reach some agreement, which is completely untrue. Um, European polit politicians, they don't understand that uh, the ruling people in Belarus and Russia are not uh, reasonable men. They're professional criminals, both Putin and Lukashenko. Lukashenko killed uh, multiple of peoples in Belarus. The same did Putin. He uh, accused of killing at least, uh, I believe, uh, four of his political opponents. So uh, they, uh, poli uh, European countries, they, they should stop thinking about uh, politicians in Russia and Belarus as, as partners. They should uh, stop, uh, start thinking about them as criminals, uh, as dictators. And they uh, should uh, think from the fourth side what can they do to force them to leave their power and be more calm? Thank you, Rodion. Violetta, what would Belarus citizens expect from the US? Yeah, I would agree with Arion, and I would say that we should not expect a lot of things from the US. And I wanted to go back to the point that Dmitry was discussing about the comparison between Maidan and the situation in Belarus. I think like if the United States or if the European Union um, gets too far, like just normal Belarusian people can do this comparison between Maidan and the situation in Belarus. And I think that's not what we want. So like, yeah, I agree that we need to try to make this information as public as possible to make everyone aware about that. But we definitely like people in Belarus because of our mentality, we don't want to have Maidan, that's for sure. And we've shown that we want our pro protest to be peaceful. And like with foreign intervention, we might like change this direction and less and less people might go on the streets afterwards. So I think like we should be really careful with that. Thank you, Violetta. We have two minutes and I would ask you to answer this last question in one sentence. The last question is, do you think that the protest will be successful? We start with Catherine. An impossible question to answer, but they've already been successful insofar as it's a mobilization that we haven't seen in decades. And so for that, I'm already optimistic. Thank you, Catherine. Dimitro. In the long term, yes. In the short term, probably no. 
I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic. I believe in the long-term perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, Rodion, will the protests be successful? No, uh, the power is too unequal at the moment. Maybe That's 10 years the beginning from of now, the next yes. panel. Yeah, okay. So we have two yes and we have one no. Violetta, do you think that the protests will be successful? I agree with Catherine. We've had some progress, but I'm scared that this progress might work against us right now because, yeah, uh, Lukashenko showed that he doesn't want to transfer the power to anyone. And yeah, I want to hope that yes, but. Yeah, sure. want, wanting to hope is the first step towards hope. Friends, uh, this would be the beginning of the next panel. Disagreement on a panel is always a good sign. I want to thank you all for participating in this very insightful, slightly depressing, but these are the political realities of these days uh, panel that we have shared. I want to thank uh, Connor Brand and our communication team, Grant Osborne and Tim Checkley to help us with the technological side of this panel. And uh, check out the blog at the website of the IWM.AT uh, to uh, stay tuned. And please uh, keep in, be, you know, continue to be interested in the Nanovic Institute for European Affairs. Have a lovely evening and afternoon, and thank you so much. Bye bye now. Bye bye.